this our time? Yes, that's right. Now, we didn't do this a week ago, but we're going to do it from here on out. At least that's the game plan. Uh, post some little headlines on Tuesdays. You get a one-hour bonus. It's not really the Jeff Cameron show per se. Kind of is. It, it's me. Um, but it's, you know, it's just it's just different. It's different because we don't have the bed for the music. We're not doing any of that. We're separating this out, sort of, uh, sort of a deal here. By the way, this hour, Shane Burnham going to join me on the program. He's the director of football for Ascension Sport. Uh, you know the name, Shane Burnham. He was a... Uh, uh, an analyst for Florida State, a senior defensive analyst uh, for Florida State the last couple of years and um, and has spent a lifetime in college uh, football. His dad's Wally Burnham, who famously uh, coached college football as an elite coach uh, under Bobby Bowden, amongst others. Um, and and so anyhow, I wanted to talk to him because he's gotten into the NIL space uh, as, as representation. And I want to have a chance to talk to him a little bit about the dynamic that has shifted and changed in college sports where – you know, whether it's going really well or if it's going poorly, uh, your locker room is affected and NIL affects it in both those scenarios. And, you know, I, I think more and more people in the game, either former coaches, former players, both in his case, are going to get involved and start doing stuff like this because they see the need. You know, that's the necessity that breeds this sort of thing where, where you can recognize uh, from both vantage points uh, what's, what's needed here to help paint a clearer picture uh, for a player, for a prospect, right? You know, for a, for a high school kid or an existing college player, because as this thing has sort of played out, one of the things that we've learned is that in some cases, players have not been able to benefit as much as perhaps they should have uh, in some cases. And other cases, uh, coaches have had their programs um, gutted and damaged and uh, and they've had to go about the process of uh, trying to inform a player who's getting misinformation from shaky guidance off the field, all that sort of thing. And I just think that there is a place in this space for former coaches, former players, people who get the game, who understand what's happening right now. And, um, you know, Shane's doing that. So we're going to interview him. That'll be in the second segment here and get his thoughts on, on, what this what's happening in college football right now you know something i want to address that yesterday we kind of we took a cursory glance at and glossed over but i heard so much of it again last night and i heard it again this morning when i got up and did what i normally do which is uh, walk the dogs grab a cup of coffee sit down kind of catch up on the world news of the day and then get into my sports first of all unbelievable game last night i'll touch on that momentarily but here you go uh Somehow, and this is, you know, Tom alluded to it yesterday, certain conversations begin to happen around your program when you're not winning, when things have gone south, when it looks as ugly as it looks currently at Florida State uh, through three games. A lot of conversations that, in my opinion, uh, eventually, uh, at least early on, border on the absurd. And what am I talking about? Well, somehow I've seen Mike Norvell's name linked to that of Billy Napier. And these are two entirely different situations. Napier has had no success at all at Florida. He's never been able to gain traction. Uh, and he's in a situation where um, he could very well be let go. Now, that's different. That's when you're going on, you know, another losing season. They, this would be Florida's fourth consecutive losing season, by the way. Uh, so, again, a different situation. Mike Norvell just helped engineer a 13-0 and regular season conference championship run. Uh, he's also a guy, as David Hale pointed out on ESPN.com, who prior to the start of this season had gone 28-7 and in his last 35 games. Uh, that put him in rarefied air. If you look at the company, uh, it's, it's that of uh, Nick Saban. It's, it's that of Kirby Smart and Ryan day. It's like those guys had a better record, but only those coaches were ahead of Mike Norvell over these last few years. Um, and so, you know, again, Mike has even still an awful lot of goodwill built up and rightfully so. I think the difference here is that massive changes may be had, or may have to happen 
for for people to be reassured that things are going to change for Mike after this disastrous beginning. But most importantly, what should be conveyed here is that in no way, shape, or form is Mike Norvell on the hot seat. If Florida fires uh, Napier, he would be due around $26 million <clears throat> should he be let go. Um, so that's how that would work. Right now, you've probably read the stories. Gator Boosters and others are pledging to raise the funds necessary to make it happen. And on this show over the years, we've called that the great kiss my ass on Main Street moment, baby, because there's not much better than getting told that you no longer have to work and that to not work, you will receive, in this case, $26 million. In Mike Norvell's case, to be specific, and why I tell you there is no way he's on the hot seat and there's no chance Short of some sort of for-cause reason, there is no chance Mike Norvell will get fired. They don't have to win a game and he wouldn't get fired. I'll do you one better. I think you could make a compelling argument. And let's hope we don't have to find out. I think you can make a compelling argument given all that Florida State has going on with the legal battle, with the money being spent on the stadium renovations and, you know, reconstruction. Uh with the football only facility, with all that is happening for Florida State that is involving a lot of money, Mike Norvell could go over this year. You could lose to Charleston Southern. You could lose you could lose every game and Mike Norvell wouldn't be fired. And better yet, he could lose every game this year and only win four next. And he probably wouldn't be fired. You want to know why? Florida State would be on the hook for 60. Five million dollars just for him. That equates to 85% of his base salary and supplemental pay for the remainder of the current contract. That's what would have to happen. 65. Now, now you're just scratching the surface because you fire him. You got to get in and bring in a new coach. What's that going to cost you? Well, that new coach is going to want a staff because you're also letting all those other guys go. Guys, this quickly adds up into astronomical sums that get you in the neighborhood of whatever, $150, $200 million. You're not going to do that. And again, I don't think they should do that. And I don't think they're going to lose all their games. But I'm just pointing out there is virtually no chance that Mike Norvell is fired this year, no matter how it looks. It has to look better. You hope that it's going to look better. Uh, it's, it's stunning to think about how this could happen. We're all searching for answers. But one answer to the test is not going to be fire Mike Norvell. Uh, now, I do think, again, that in all likelihood, changes will be made. And I also think that some of that could be unavoidable. You know, coaches typically, if you just go back and look at the history of college coaches and, you know, when they fire guys, when they don't fire guys, how it how it happens that staff changes are made. When you go back and you look at stuff like that, one of the things you find out is that most of the time coaches don't feel like they, they, they need to fire somebody unless somebody's grossly negligent. That somebody is just, you know, not working very hard, um, you know, failing miserably at what they do. If a coach thinks that the person is trying hard and he already respected his knowledge or he wouldn't have hired him, they're, they're apt to give opportunities until what? Until their ass is in the jackpot when they are beginning to look at having changes forced upon them or it's a protective layer, right? The first thing you do to protect yourself is make changes on your staff. Eventually, if that doesn't work, they come for you. Um, also, if it affects the money, that oftentimes dictates terms there. So again, I would tell you that they're going to have a bad year. I think it's unavoidable. I think we've seen enough wrong with this team now to know they're not good. There are going to be people that are very, a lot of people, uh, this is a results business. This is a, what have you done for me lately business? Uh, we're already quickly seeing that 13 and O season, the 13 and one season as a, a, a distant memory. We already see that in the rear view now, but uh, the reality is this, this would be uh, I think the, the precursor to uh things that affect the money and change 
uh, the formula for Mike in the offseason. He may begrudgingly have to make a few changes. People, you guys, the email, the, the tweets, and uh, some of the stuff I see on the boards asking about, you know, over, under on the number of coaches. I tend to always say less than. I always say fewer. You know, if you say five changes need to be made, I might agree with you. Do I think five changes are going to be made on this staff of the of the on the field coaches? I don't. I don't think that. No. Uh, do if you you know? I, I think it'd be more like two, maybe three. Now, there's a big difference between what I think should happen and and and, and maybe even what I would do, which is kind of a crazy game. I'm not in those rooms. I'm not having those conversations. Uh, you know, I I, I don't it doesn't do me any good to tell you what I think he should do uh, other than I do think he's got some guys that have not won in recruiting and it's hurting him now. And then there's also some on field stuff that we document on a regular basis on this show. That's a reoccurring problem. There are people responsible for those problems and you could rightfully assess that as having been uh, having done a poor job. And if that's the case, uh, then, you know, you move on. You, you make a decision to move on. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be as many as people want because everybody wants heads to roll when you're having the kind of season Florida State is. Shane Burnham, Director of Football Ascension Sport, lifetime in the game, going to join us next on the Jeff Cameron Show, 93.3 Real Talk Radio and War Champ TV. Welcome back, Jeff Cameron Show, 93.3 Real Talk Radio, as well as War Chant, War Chant TV, of course. That is Shane Burnham, by the way, Director of Football for Ascension Sport. I, I want, we're going to get some NIL talk. Shane, uh, if you guys don't know, his dad, Wally Burnham, famously coached for a very long time, including with Bobby Bowden. Shane himself was a great player in the SEC, was a defensive <laughs> analyst recently for Florida State, is now – uh, entered, entered, entered into a world that we're all talking about constantly. And so I figured it would be good to get his expertise uh, on the air here and just kind of pick your brain. Shane, first of all, welcome in. I appreciate you joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Good to see you again. Yeah, good, to see you, good to see you too. Yeah. You know, I, it's a, it's funny. College football started back up and everybody's locked in again. And it seems like for me on a show, on a daily basis, I get questions about NIL. I get questions about players and their deals and representation. Uh, and also from the coaching perspective, and I thought knowing you as I do, uh, and this is something you're doing now in terms of representation, uh, nobody better than you than to pick your brain from both sides of it. First of all, how has that dynamic changed uh, college football and, and, and locker rooms and what coaches deal with as well as what players deal with in your mind? There's so much to pick at here. It's fascinating. It really is. It's a fascinating time to be a fan of college football. It's certainly a fascinating time to be inside the sport as a coach. You know, NIL, portal, you know, collectives, all those things have just added a whole new element to, you know, trying to manage your locker room. And uh, whether that's in good times, bad times, just, you know, how those dealings, those negotiations are handled within your program, uh, you know, the way kids handle that within that locker room and how kids absorb that information. It just makes it more complex than ever to be a college football coach and manage all those feelings inside your locker room. And it's got to be difficult because obviously players have to look out for themselves. They need people who understand the game. This is where I imagine you would come in, Shane, as a former player yourself uh, in a league like the SEC, as somebody who's coached uh, a lot of places, Elon, Iowa State, Rutgers, UCF, Florida, I mean, a lot of places. Uh, you've seen it all from both perspectives. And so I guess I would ask you, I guess let's start with player representation, right? Okay, so we know – just from years of watching college football, consuming college football, that this could be a shady landscape. You have some shady characters uh, that misrepresent what's happening in the game, misrepresent what a school is willing to do, misrepresent what a player can get or where he should go. And obviously nobody wants that. We don't want, and I don't want to disparage any one person, but you don't want some uncle or aunt or somebody who's not really a professional in this realm, who doesn't understand it, to be representing kids and giving them bad advice just like you also don't want it to be one sided the other way where the schools get all the advantages. So I guess just start with player representation. What kind of things do you tell players now if they're interested in having you represent them that you'll provide? You know, I think what's interesting about that space that's been created the last three years, right? This 
I've had an agent as a coach over the last 25 years. I've had, you know, many players come through the college process into the NFL draft process and go through agency selection. So, you know, that's always been there, just not in this space uh, with the football, you know, the current student athletes. So what is unique is most of these kids are on one year deals that are on these collective deals. So in a way you're getting paid next year for what you do this year. And that mm. certainly adds to some of those things we were talking about a few minutes ago, but you know, what we can do for any student athlete that comes to us, you know, we're a full house agency. And as, as you go through the process, as they come through and if they're able to take that opportunity at the next level, the same service will be provided and we'd help them make an agency selection there. Cause that's not where we're going to specialize. We're going to stay in this college market, but you know, it starts, we offer anything from financial literacy, financial planning, allowing these guys to tax shelter their collective deals or NIL deals. We build brand partnerships uh, with different corporate um, partnerships we've created that rise indoor through Ascension Sports. And then certainly, you know, we train kids in the off season. We offer them that. We offer, uh, you know, nutrition, sports psych. It's a, it's a full house um, representation is what we're allowed and able to do for kids in the college space now. So education, just like everything else, is the key here. Uh, knowing what's possible, knowing what's out there, knowing what you could have and what you need to know. Uh, I think, you about know, trying to find your true market value. You know, there's so much ignorance in this process right now. There is no salary cap. There is no known, really set market out there for the public to know about. So for a kid to find his true value and for the university to understand, you know, what they're, uh, they're dealing with on the other side, I think representation is needed now. Um, you know, these are big, large sums these kids are dealing with. Uh, and certainly the, the ignorance because they don't know the landscape. And I've had parents call me, hey, am I allowed to ask about NIL? Am I allowed to ask? Uh, yeah, more than allowed, you know, uh, you'd be doing your son a disservice if you don't have that conversation. But there's a lot of ignorance in the space. And uh, just through the way the system has been created, you know, there's just a lot of things that are unknown where I think through relationships we have over the last 30 years of coaching, uh, through information, just um, through those relationships, I think, we are unique in that we can cut through the static. We can get to different uh, staffs across the country and certainly provide more accurate information than some of these uncles and aunts you might be referring to. Yeah, true market value is an interesting thing to talk about, right? How does one figure that out? It seems that we've seen cases where some teams, some programs – are willing to reset the market for a kid. They're willing to go all in. Uh, we won't get specific, but we've seen that in college football where astronomical sums have been offered up in some cases. And in other cases, kids thinking that they're capable of acquiring that kind of offer when in fact the value's not there and there's nobody, no matter what this person who's representing them currently says, there's nobody that's going to pay them 400,000, 500,000. Just those kinds of uh, wild swings in, in true market value. As you said, there's no cap. You don't know what one program is willing to do and what another won't or will based on certain things that we've read up to this point. Uh, how do you go about that process? Well, I think every university and every collective, there's a different starting point, whether they're going to you know get based based on get involved based on the leverage the kid has. Uh, there's some schools they have a, you know, based on the stars or, you know, your uh, recruiting profile, you might garner more money. Some come in at a base level playing field and, you know, you earn as you go based on how you play. So I think the starting, the jumping off place for every university is so different right now. So how they choose to attack it, um, you know, it's still the Wild West and their ability to be creative in that space is different uh, and, and from school to school. So I think, again, that's part of the problem for these kids and just not knowing that every school is different in how they start their approach. A lot of them are based on leverage. You know, if, if, uh, if a young man has a competing offer, uh, we've seen that where guys try to leverage those collectives all the right. way down to signing day as recent as last, you know, every signing class, but last year uh, here in Tallahassee as well. So uh, every case is different. But again, I think that's where, um, you know, and it's not all about a collective decision. I think these kids, it's about the next place in this journey, the NFL, you know, trying to put yourself for these elite athletes, elite prospects in the right program, not just about collectives, you know, development, um, uh, are they a portal program? Are they portal on top of kids? You know, who have they produced? The strength staff, all those things that I think we can provide information on are critical in these decisions. Well, you hear from coaches and you certainly hear from players. And as I said at the top of this, you were both. 
What would you like to see change in this space that would be good for both parties? What's something that you think would be equitable for a player and for a coach to expect in this wild West college football has to help itself here. Uh, we don't know where that's coming from. There is no czar of college football. Lord knows everybody's got complaints about the NCAA. Uh, I know you have to tiptoe carefully around this subject, but I am kind of curious. What would you, what kind of uh, protections for both parties would you like to see in place that would help college football? Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, <laughs> You look at the ruling that passed in the House not too long ago and, you know, where they tried to put some guardrails in place. And now there's some, you know, some reverb back on that last week and where that's going to go. It's really a complicated answer uh, issue. And I'm not sure if I have an answer for that complicated issue, but some transparency would be great where these kids understand, um, you know, what is out in the marketplace. You know, you see the NIL assist website that they launched through Influencer and uh, came out about a month ago, I believe. And, they're trying to, you know, allow some of that uh, to come to light, but that would be helpful for both parties. Uh, you know, some type of contract where right now it's unrestricted free agency. And at the end of every year, a kid can renegotiate unless these, some of these collectives have signed kids to two year deals to try to maybe stem that and, um, you know, stop that from happening. But, you know, I think some type of parameters, guardrails, whether it's contract length, I'll say contract because that's, uh, yeah. basically what we're talking about here, but it's a, uh, you know, length, um, you know, this, the ability for the mark for these guys to move without any restriction, is just impossible for a college program to really navigate and, and plan for it. Just, it, it, it's, I'm not sure if it's sustainable from, from the program standpoint as a coach. Shane, it's fascinating. Think about it. This doesn't happen in the NFL. <laughs> this doesn't like there are real protections. People do know what people make. You have an idea yeah. of what's expected of you. There's a three year deal or a four year deal. We know what the cap hit number is. Mm -hmm. If you move on from a guy, right? Or you trade a guy, you know what dead money is. You know all this stuff. And yet in college football, uh, we've created a situation where, and I mean, even if you were fair minded and wanted players to be paid, and I was somebody who advocated it in some manner, mm -hmm. you do. You do understand and feel for coaches who say, wait a minute, I got to re-recruit my locker room every year. And this is a case where, Shane, you know this, if you win a bunch of games, guys say, well, look at that. I'm a big reason why we won a bunch of games. I want more money. And if you lose a bunch of games and things go south, well, that creates a dynamic in the locker room where everybody's looking at each other like that guy's getting paid. How come he's here and we're not winning games? You know, I can't imagine what you do as a coach day in and day out to keep from a locker room being shredded by this. Yeah, it's, it's the new normal, you know, going forward, at least until the, the guardrails are put in place. I don't know how you do it either. Like I said, it's, you know, I don't know why Cook Saban got out of coaching. I know he made the, the, <laughs> the comment that it became more transactional and less relational, I believe was his quote. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's to your point. You know, you see some of that. Um, you know, I talked to some of my buddies at smaller schools. When I say smaller schools, maybe it's a group of five, good right. group of fives who are winning conference championships and then getting cherry picked. And, you know, that's frustrating for those guys, right? Cause they're developing a kid. They do a good job recruiting, they develop, and then they can't compete uh, with what some of these schools are coming to uh, them with. It's a trickle down effect. Then they go down a level below, um, you know, I don't know how as a coach you manage that. It, it's again, that's what I think we're all watching in real time all over college football right now. Um, you know, when, when you win, like you said, when you win, I'd rather have those problems. Than yeah, that's a much better right. problem to have. But, but to your to your point, um, I think that's what everybody's scratching their head about as coaches. You know, when I talk to my buddies across college football, I think most of them, a even within their own staff, there's really no clarity how they're doing it. And I think that's on purpose, right? I mean, we're not supposed to know. The NCAA has that outside of the house right now, so there's a lot of you know, you know not much clear you know clarity on and what's going on within even each staff. Um, whether that's on purpose or not, I don't know. But certainly, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a frustrating time to be a college coach, I think. Well, you spent a lifetime in the game, uh, just as your dad did. And, and, and obviously, we all love college football. Um, I also wonder how this is affecting, and maybe you can inform me here. Uh, we're talking to Director of Football, Ascension Sports, Shane Burnham. Uh, Shane, how's it? My son plays high school football. He's a junior at Leon. Um, I got another kid playing. So I, you know, I don't know what their future holds if college football is in their future or not. I just know that I've heard from some high school coaches say that this whole thing has created a mess as well. But uh, look, it's the bottom line. People are going to stop playing football. It's a wonderful game. It's an awesome game. It teaches life lessons. It's all those things. But 
How, how do you how do you come at it as opposed to talking to a college kid and what's out there for them uh, as opposed to a high school kid when you when you interact with parents that are calling you and inquiring about your services for a high school kid? Yeah, you know, it's just really when the college kids, it's outside of the brand, you know, and NIL and some of those true name image likeness opportunities. It's just a totally different world. You know, you're dealing in portal, you know, typically yeah. are renegotiating with the collective. So conversations uh, with the universities and collectives are happening in, in a much smaller window where when you're with these kids through the recruiting process, you know, we have 26s, we have 27s, we have 25s, but, and they're all at different places in the process, but it's certainly a much more drawn out relational process at, at this point. Uh, and the collectives and the NIL, you know, advisement consultation, some of that's not even happening yet and, until we get a little closer to signing day and, uh, with the 26s and 27s, 25s, they've had that conversation. So we've already traversed that with those kids. And uh, and really, that's just about trying to make these kids aware of what collectives can truly offer, you know, what uh, is out there. You got to call them kickers, right? Some of these kids have the ability not only to get a collective, but it could be a lease at an apartment, a lease with a car, travel for parents. You know, there's different things that we are, are able to do for these kids um, in a much slower way through the high school prospects. And then the college kids, uh, it's need based. You get calls from coaches. Hey, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for that. Uh, and, and they're happening right now as we get into September and these guys kind of know their roster. They're starting to call me and ask, you know, what's available in the portal. We need help, you know, right now for uh, next, next fall. Shane, one last couple things here. I'm, I'm just kind of curious. I, I was, I was talking with somebody the other day uh, who's in this space and they were saying that, um, yeah, you know, there's a misnomer out there when it comes to, players out of the high school ranks, they don't all just go wherever they get the most amount of money. They, they mentioned that uh, there was a player, a big time player, won't say who he is, who uh, everybody wanted and that he ended up going to a place that was not his best offer financially, um, that it is still uh, somewhat relationships. Yes, NIL has to be there. Yes, collectives matter. Yes, all of this is a big part of what we're talking about here, but that it's still about getting to know a kid early on, identifying talent, uh, knowing high school coaches, uh, getting connected with people like yourself who have these relationships because of a lifetime in football. Uh, do you think that that's true? Or are kids, as we move forward in this process, going to basically take the best free agent offer there is? Yeah, I think you see a little bit of both. But my advice has always been any kid I've recruited over the last 30 years and, and kids we're dealing with in this space, whether it's the, our college uh, clients or the high school kids, that – collective piece that should be the last uh, okay. box we're checking in my mind again when we're dealing with these elite athletes and they have a real chance to go uh, and play at the next level if you know, Jalen Wiggins here in town not one of ours but a young man here in town who you know he needs to make a, a decision based on the NFL I mean what I mean is education uh, ability to develop in that program uh, all those things should come first in this decision making process to me that's the advice I would recommend uh, to any kid in this, but certainly you see guys who are, you know, there's a money grab. And I think to a lesser, you'd see kids that go to logos, whether it's for money or just make a poor decision based on a logo. And the portal has proved that to me. There's so many kids that go on the portal that we'd watch over the last several years when I was at Florida state that, you know, wow, I don't know how they ended, ended up where they were in the first place. Um, is that what inspired you? I'm sorry, Shane. Is that what inspired you to get involved in this now? Because we've seen <laughs> cases all across the country where you think, oh, man, that kid got bad advice. He was ill-informed. And, you know, that's heartbreaking. Nobody wants to see that. Yeah, no, I've seen a lot of kids make, you know, again, whether it's the money grab, their, their feelings get hurt uh, over some type of uh, you know, interaction in the recruiting process or in the recruitment. Yeah, certainly I, these guys are uh, – you know, in a lot of cases, making short-sighted decisions. And, and I, I think, you know, whether it's through ignorance or through uh, ego pride, you know, where they uh, mm -hmm. they feel like they're getting slighted and they're, and they're making a, a, pro, a move to another program that's not in their best interest. But, yeah, that and this, you know, being in that portal space, Jeff, with Burst and all those guys that I, we were, you know, uh, Fisk, all those guys that I was a party to, you know, I realized there's a lot of good football players out there who aren't getting the help, and then there's some who are getting the help that, don't even realize the market that they, uh, their market value. Hey, here's something we can both smile about. How about seeing those guys on the same field? What a cool game. Like Arizona and the Rams, every knoll everywhere had to be smiling ear to ear. Wasn't that awesome? Yeah, and to see Tatum out there, I saw Tatum leading the breakdown this past week for uh, the 49ers. 
yeah, great kids. And, you know, so happy to see them have success at the next level. Hey, Shane, we'll be in touch again down the line. It's good seeing you around town. You know, I always enjoy talking with you. Uh, best of luck with this. It's uh, You are with Ascension Sport for people who want to know more. Obviously, they can find you on Twitter. I'll point all that out and we'll post this up there. But uh, thanks for making the time, buddy. It's good to talk to you. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Appreciate you. Yeah, take care. Appreciate uh, Shane Burnham joining us, lending a little insight into an ever-changing space. We say that all the time about NIL. A lot of times we look at it from the collective's perspective. Here's a, a chance to look at it from representation perspective, uh, which everybody on both sides admit that this, you know, if you don't like something, wait till tomorrow, it'll change. If you do like something, don't hold your breath. It's likely to change everything in between. This is constantly evolving. But I think both sides, and not to make them adversarial, would agree wholeheartedly that something does have to change. If there were more, as, as Shane said, if there was better transparency for all involved. But also, I think we, we got to come to a place where I don't know if it's a cap, but certainly there's a an, an agreed upon payroll salary cap, if you will. Uh, it, and I don't like capping something, but I, I do know that you have to have unilateral uh, uh, agreements in place where everybody understands under what uh, rules you're playing. Uh, and, and so until we get that, I, I do think that fans get frustrated by this. I, I like the conversation about, because I think it's important to bring this up again and again and again, that, you know, a lot of these guys, yes, sometimes it's about paying a player a bunch of money or having certainly a collective in place that can anyhow. Uh, but But more often than not, it is much more complicated than that. It's not that simple. It is a little bit about, uh, or a lot of it, about relationships in addition to having those opportunities uh, if you sign on. So I don't know. I, I think that's kind of my way of also saying, I don't want to let our coaches off the hook for not having forged those bonds and, and not having cashed in on the opportunity that a 13 and 0 season presented you. Um, you know, it's, it, you got to do better than what Florida state was uh, on pace to do. And I, certainly like to see some of those things change. When we talk about changes uh, with, with Mike Norvell and his staff, He's got to find a way to make greater inroads there. Uh, we'll see. By the way, last night's Philadelphia-Atlanta game, and this is nuts. So I'm not going to tell you specifically who this was, but part of what I enjoy about having been honest with you guys about my own wagering habits is that I've invited – a deluge of emails and tweets, and for people who know me, texts of these amazing situations that people find themselves in the gambling world. And one was on display last night that absolutely, I'm nervous for the guy. So I have this friend who I'm at my son's open house yesterday at Leon, all right? And you go and you meet the teachers and you get a, you learn a little bit about them and what they do and, and all of that, right? So that's where I'm at. And I get this text in one of my son's classes. I feel like a student who's trying to sneak a note or something like that. I get this text from a buddy who says, hey, man, I've got a friend. And he's done quite well on a parlay in the NFL but it concludes tonight. What do you think he should do with this wager? So here's the wager, and I'm looking at it right now on my phone. This guy, not going to tell you who he is, took the Packers to win, the Raiders to win, the Browns to win. These are all plus money bets. The Saints to win, the Vikings to win, the Buccaneers to win, and you guessed it, Following the trend, the Falcons to win on the road against the Eagles. Now, it's a relatively small bet in terms of what he put down. Obviously, it's a hell of a parlay. To have already hit on one, two, three, four, five, six underdogs is seldom seen. And you need a seventh, seven underdogs. 
and you picked the right underdogs. Seven underdogs to win for you to cash in. This nominal bet was an opportunity to cash into the tune of over $55,000. And I got to tell you, I've had some cool moments and had some really thrilling endings. Um, I think it was Steven Yeager, right? Didn't I have him last year in a, a bet to win a golf tournament outright? And he was trying to hold off Scotty Scheffler. And I could have cashed out early, but I held in there and he won by a stroke. And it was cool, but I didn't win anywhere in the neighborhood of $55,000. No, I did not. I won a couple of grand. So that's cool when you have something like that happen because it can fund the rest of your golf wagers for the rest of the year. Or if you put the money aside, it could be a vacation, whatever the hell you want it to be. And there are varying degrees that people like to, to get down. I know that, right? But trying to pick outrights in the golf market is pretty difficult. So when you win one, you take great pride in it, you smile, and you move along. All right, well, so that was neat. And I've won a few decently sized wagers. But this guy's got a chance to win, maybe not life-changing money, but I mean, in some capacity it is. If you win $55,000, uh, you know, you pay off your mortgage, you could, or pay a big chunk off your mortgage, you could travel. If you've never been able to travel, you could, it's retirement, uh, you could pour into, you know, whatever stocks. I, I don't, you could do, um, uh, you pay off your car. You could uh, obviously put it in for college funds for your kids. Just so many things. So it's going to make watching, in my opinion, it would have made watching Atlanta, Philadelphia nearly impossible last night. Because the, the, the question I got when my friend texted me is, what should he do with this bet? Because you get these early cash outs. And this is on the hard rock. The cash out for his, for his nominal bet was going to be uh, 14,000 something. I don't remember exactly. It was going to be like $14,800. So if you lay a $20 bet and you got a chance to win $14,000 and you don't have to let it ride and you can sit back and say, man, I threw pizza money at something. I want a car like, or, or you could hedge. You could say, okay, uh, I'm going to cash out. And then I'm going to bet, I don't know, the Eagles on the money line with a portion of this and but you, you get, you get my point. You could do any number of things, you know, by the way, in Las Vegas, one of the things you can do is uh, ticket swap or something of that ilk. There are these companies, there are these websites that will buy your ticket. People will bid on your ticket. So if the payout was $14,800 from Hard Rock, somebody may come swooping in and say, you know what? I like that bet. I think that uh, that guy is going to win the $55,000. Uh, he doesn't want to take the risk. He wants to secure a profit. I've got backers. I'll take the risk. I'll throw down uh, 17000 for your ticket, sir. And then you have it. You're now the proud owner of that ticket, hoping like hell, obviously, that your $17,000 investment turns into a $55,000 win, uh, obviously, which nets you, you know, 42, 41. So th there you are all of a sudden, right? There, there you are, 38. So you, you, you're all set at that point. But I don't, that's not really offered in Florida that I'm aware of, and I need to start checking that out. So I'm trying to give this guy advice. He's asking what to do. I give him a bunch of uh, options that will secure a profit. All right. But I don't know what he decides to do. I didn't get the, 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 the text back. I, I went on with my son's open house. I get home, fix dinner. We're all hanging out as a family. We start watching that game. I kind of forget about that guy's question. We get into the second half of that game. It's very, very close. I decide I'm going to watch the fourth quarter in bed. So I do what all old men do. I go back to the back and I'm like, eh, I'm going to call it a day. So I'll, I've got the game on very low. My wife's complaining that I got the TV on and I've fallen in and out of sleep. I want to stay awake. It's a good game, but we live in the modern world because here's the deal. You're just going to get up and watch the highlights and see it. Anyhow, it's not a Bucks game. It's not a Dolphins game. It's not a Jags game. It's not a game that I'm going to have to carry on about the next day. I mean, I am going to have to talk about it a little bit like I'm doing now. So I forget. I fall asleep. I fall asleep. Whenever I watch a game in the back, TV timer's on. I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. My eyes open up because I'm old and I have to pee. I get up. I go to the bathroom. I get a cup of water. And all of a sudden, eureka, it hits me. Oh, man, the game. Who won the game? 
So I grab my phone and I see that the Falcons come back miraculously to win that game by a point. And I can't help but think of my buddy's friend. So I text him at four something in the morning and say, hey, man, uh, when you wake up and see this, what the dude decide to do? And I'm happy to report, even though I'm not sure I would have done this, he let it ride. 155 grand, just over 55 grand on a $20 bet. Congrats to whoever that guy is. And man, could you, I ask you this now, could you watch that game? Could you watch that game? I was thinking, because we were just talking, Corey was just in here, right? Uh, that guy can't watch games that he just cares about the team. Just like, I, I, it, there's a phenomenon that happens as you get older. My stepdad, I've said this before, a UF law grad, is a bull gator. Makes for interesting th Thanksgivings. Uh, anyhow, in, in years where Florida was any good at all, I'm not even talking about national championship good, just any good at all. He would not watch the biggest games. Wouldn't watch them. So like if Alabama, I mean, excuse me, if Florida's playing Alabama or playing Georgia or something, and there's a lot on the line, and they potentially have a chance to, to, to win a national championship or an SEC title, he can't watch the game. He has to go outside. He distracts himself with a million other things. I am so glad that this phenomena of uh, becoming uh, more delicate with your fandom uh, as we age has not struck me. If anything, I've gotten a lot better about watching games. Like, you know, I was just with Tom over the weekend. We were watching our Bucks together, having a cocktail or two, enjoying the Bucks Lions game. Um, he had the Mets on and one of the other TVs that were there. You know, it's like there's a lot going on. There's a, it's it's tough to take in, but uh, but he can still watch. You know, if the Pirates when the Pirates made the playoffs eight years ago, whatever that was, there for those couple of years, uh, believe me, it had been a long time. And I was able to watch all those games. I didn't have to walk outside. I wasn't losing my mind. I can't, it seems to defeat the purpose as a fan to not be able to watch games that you're invested in. Now, this is a financial investment, but it's a minor financial investment. You stood to lose 20 bucks. You probably don't view it that way. You stood to lose $55,000, but it wasn't 55 that you had already. It was found money in a way. Uh, I do think it is a lot harder if you're trying to watch a game that potentially changes your financial fortunes for the year, uh, or let alone for some people, you know, two and three years changes your life, I guess. Uh, but you can't be a gambler if that's the way you view watching games that you have action on. And you can't really be a diehard fan if every time your team is good, you can't watch them because you're going to have a heart attack. You can't. You got to be able to watch the games. I can't fathom it. By the way, tonight here we go. MLB. We're down to a good time of the year where everybody gets set for the playoffs and everybody's got their mind on their college and pro football teams. It'll be a little bit easier for you as a baseball fan uh, now that if you're also a no, because now that uh, Florida State season is uh, somewhat no more, uh, you will allow yourself to reinvest in baseball at this time. Giants, Orioles, Blake Snell, Albert Suarez. Dodgers, Marlins, Bobby Miller, Darren McLaughlin, Twins, Guardians, Zebby Matthews. The guy's name is Zebby. Gavin Williams goes for the Guardians. Braves, Reds, Grant Holmes, Brandon Williamson, Red Sox, Rays, Nick Pavetta, Shane Baz, Nationals, Mets. Mets win in extra innings last night. Braves lose. Mets up on Braves. Mitchell Parker goes for the Nats. Tyler McGill goes for the Mets. Uh, Phillies, Brewers, Zach Wheeler, Frankie Montas. We got the Tigers and the Royals, Casey Mize, Cole Reagans, Tallahassee's own. Cole's had a good year, man. Look at that. 11 and 9, 3 3 2, 211 strikeouts. Good for you. And the Royals are a fun team. A's, Cubs, Mitch Spence, Jordan Wicks, Pirates, Cardinals, Bailey Falter, Lance Lynn. But alas, appreciate the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates scoring no runs. Exactly zero runs for my man Skeens last night, huh? Yeah, shocking, I know, right? Zero runs.
Haley Falter tonight, Lance Lynn for the cards. Blue Jays, Rangers, TBD, Nathan Avaldi, D-backs, Rockies, Jordan Montgomery, Ryan Falter, White Sox, Angels, Davis, Martin, Griffin, Canning. He's a cheater on the golf course. Yankees, Mariners, Luis Gill, Brian, woo! And finally, the full slate. Astros, Padres, Hunter Brown, Michael King. Game actually means something. Don't suppose, but I might actually uh, decide to sprinkle uh, some underdog money on all those baseball teams, right? Who knows? It's baseball. Until tomorrow, where we'll get after it again on a Balls Let's get after it again. We'll get after it again on a Balls Wednesday. Uh, until then, as always, peace.